Ουσία σοφωστή, εκκλησία στο σύνδεμα και διδασκάλε. Το μόνο στο νικανόνι, τον Θεό λογανή τέμαχο σαν προζαμαχητό. Γρηγόνιε τα γματρονιέ, Θεσσαλονίκη στο κάκημα, Κυρίξτη σχαρίτο. Η κέτερε μια παντό σωθήνε τα σπίτια Orthodoxy is great star, supporter, teacher of the church, the beauty of the monks, an invincible protector of the theologians, a regular worker of the miracles, the pride of Thessalonica, preacher of grace, forever do you intercede. That our souls may be saved. Father, give the blessing so we can start. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, may the Lord our God bless and protect us this evening. May the Spirit come upon Constantine that he will give us the much wisdom and knowledge as we need, that he will help us and guide us throughout the Lent, and may us glorify his name forever. May the Lord God be with us. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you for giving up your Sunday afternoons. This is the uh, last uh, of our talks here in Tampa, and most of you came to some of the other talks. And as you know, today our church commemorates the great theologian, the boast of the Saloniki, Saint Gregory Palamas. And it would take hours upon hours to really explain the significance of the works of Saint Gregory Palamas. But tonight, with the little time that I have to prepare, you know, I will just try to give you a taste of the struggle of this amazing champion of orthodoxy. He's one of the pillars of orthodoxy in the uh, second millennium after St. Portheos the Great and St. Mark of Ephesus. Actually, it was St. Potios, then St. Gregory Palamas, and the continued work of St. Gregory was taken up by St. Mark of Ephesus. Actually, we are quickly looked up and they call Ephes uh, Mark of Ephesus a Palamite. And the work, the, the work uh, you know, the theology of Palamas, or Palamism, it's not correct because that is the teaching of the church from the beginning. The theologians did not teach anything new. They took the pre-existing truth in the church and they expressed it for their time because the church was in danger. And just like today, we feel the danger coming from the New World Order. We feel the danger coming from secularism. In the same way at his time, St. Gregory Palamas, after reading and seeing some of the articles that were being cast around in Thessaloniki, he realized that the rationalism of the West was beginning to infiltrate the church and the Orthodox. It starts out as a fashion. You know, new things are attractive to the higher class of people. Just like a lot of the new things, new age movements, started out from Hollywood, the actors, you know, the prominent people in society. And they begin to disseminate this in the same way, this ideology that we need to become philosophers if we need to understand Christianity. We need to study a lot of books. We need to really become philosophical. And we need to understand Aristotle 
before we can understand Christianity. And St. Gregory says immediately, this is a new type of Christianity. This is another kind of Christianity. This is not the Christianity of what? The 12 fishermen, the sheep. How, you know, how can the West go so astray? And all of a sudden, with Thomas Aquinas, and after falling away from the church, you heard the term, the schism, the schism of the churches. It is an ecumenistic term. It is a term of the ecumenical dialogue that is unnecessary. Because no dialogue should take place until the West goes back and accepts the canons of the First Ecumenical Council. They changed the creed when they said that, you know, the Filiokve, the Filiokve is a terrible heresy and changes the creed, changes the theology of the church. And according to Photios and St. Gregory, we should have no dialogue until they come back to the original creed. No dialogue should take place. The feeling of St. Gregory who studied the plight of Catholicism and Western Christianity at, at that time was that Western Christianity is like a fallen elephant. It can no longer get up because they changed the doctrine of the church. They lost the yeast. And if you lose the yeast, and this has been one of my thoughts, you know, I was wondering, you know, orthodoxy was able to recover itself from heresy after heresy after in the first 1,000 years. We have Arianism, Nestorianism, we have uh, the fighters of the Holy Spirit, we have iconoclasm. But because we always have the yeast in the church, then that yeast and that remnant was able to recapture, recapture the health of the remnant and that remnant was able to help the rest of the people of the church. So we didn't have a schism of the church. We don't have, we didn't have a schism of the churches because there's only one church. The ortho, the, the church is always one. Christ built one church, one baptism, one Catholic and apostolic church. So we don't have a schism of the churches. We have a fallen branch. We have a branch that broke off from the church of Christ. So we have one church, one baptism, one faith. And this is why you're not going to hear the name of St. Gregory Palamas or St. Potios uh, from the mouths of, of, of a lot of the bishops today and a lot of the clergy today because they teach these things very clearly. Just like Christ, but no trouble saying to the Pharisees, because you're deceivers, because of their deception, you have no problem telling them that your father is the devil. But they want to talk about the love of Christ, you know, oh, Christ, it's all love. So, but when time came to speak in a very austere fashion, he did it. Because sometimes that's necessary to wake somebody up. So who is St. Gregory Palamas? Just to give you a little bit of historical information. He was born at 1290 in Constantinople. His parents worked in the palace. His father was a consular. He was a, an advisor to Andronikos Paleologos one of the emperors of Byzantium. Constantine, uh, Constantine Palamas had unceasing prayer. He prayed unceasingly. He was a holy man. He was at the state of Pharisees. And this is why we need to have these experiences in the church. St. Gregory knew this from his father. So later on, when he was around Beria, and he was in a cell, and a monk, Job, by the name of Job, was about 
60 years old, twice his age, saying Brehm was about, he was 30 years old at the time. The monk Job had an argument with St. Gregory that the Jesus prayer, this hesychastic prayer, is only for monks. And we shouldn't really give this to lay people. And he was trying to convince him of that. But St. Gregor, Gregory would not be convinced because he had the experience of his father. His father would pray at the meetings, at the assembly in the palace, when they were having a meeting, a political meeting. The emperor was right there, Constantine was right there, and he had this prayer boat, and he was praying. And then he would go in ecstasy while in the meeting to receive the answer for the meeting from the Holy Spirit. And while well, the other politicians were again mad at him, look, he's falling asleep. And he wanted, they wanted the emperor to scold him. And the emperor would say, no, 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 he's praying for us. Let him go, let him go. He's going to give us the right answer. <laughs> because the answer would come from God. And just to give you an idea of this kind of man he was, the time they were going to a monastery, I told you in another lecture that at that time there were about a thousand monasteries around Constantinople. So you can see how these people are all spiritual fathers and the unceasing prayer was practiced. So they, have, they get on a little boat because their spiritual father is at a monastery at a nearby island. So while they're sailing to get there, the wife says, come on me. She says, oh, I forgot to bring a gift for the elder. You know, when you go to the monastery, you, you take a gift. It's a nice thing to do. So, oh, what are we going to do? We're going to go empty-handed? He says, okay. So he starts praying. He begins to pray. As he's praying, he puts his hand in the water. And a huge fish comes to him. He grabs it, he brings it in, and he takes it so the elder can have a gift. <laughs> At some point, he... Uh, I guess medicine was not as good back then as it is today. They didn't have the same kind of antibiotics. And at a very young age, when Gregory was about five years old, his father was on his yeah. deathbed. And Gregory was the oldest, I believe, and then he had another four siblings, two sisters and two brothers. And his wife was panicking and she says to Constantine, please go and ask the emperor to promise to you that he's going to take care of your children. And he says, my dear wife, how could you say that? I'm going to entrust my children to a human being. I already gave them to the Virgin Mary. She's going to be your protection. And we can see the faith in practice. And of course, the Virgin Mary protected all of the children because they're all of our saints in our church. Right now, there's a, there is a, uh, an effort to, to try to enlist. We don't canonize saints in our church. They're all the saints. I mean, here, here uh, his father was doing miracles from this life. So it's a saint of our church. So there's an effort in Delia now. They did a lot of research and they found the, the cave where St. Gregory uh, was being in a setting for like five to ten years. And uh, actually the emperor later on, he went and uh, he, he looked up the cave where the saint was. So there's an effort to actually uh, enlist the entire family. Two sisters became nuns at the age of 20 when the emperor is pleading with Gregory to stay at the palace and take over you know, the work of his father. He says, please, because he was extremely well educated. He knew Aristotle better than Aristotle according to the thesis. His, uh, his teacher, Theodos Metochites, 
after Gregory, at the age of 16, he gave his thesis for the university. He finished the university at the age of 16. He knew all the known sciences. He knew Aristotle so well that he said, if Aristotle was alive, you would be totally impressed. <laughs> you expressed this philosophy better than Aristotle. And where he would have a tremendous career in the palace, just like St. John of Damascus earlier on, he gave it all up to go. Why? I mean, he knew the scriptures. He knew everything. He, he, was, he knew more academic theology than all of us put together. The theology does not take place in the mind. Theology does not take place at seminaries. You don't learn theology at seminaries. You want, I mean, I went to San Luis for four years. I didn't learn any theology. I did my own studies, but I learned how to do footnotes for the books that I published. <laughs> that I learned to do at the university. I, I don't want to say it was a waste of time, but you don't go there to learn about God. You know, if I didn't have a very strong basis, you know, some of the professors would definitely have a heyday because most of them were not only humanists, but they were, they were I mean, extremely interested about the Western theologians. You know, one of the professors, I, I guess they needed some extra work on this, so they let me study uh, the theologians of Europe. And I'm telling you, I never had such a dark summer. Mm -hmm. Such a dark summer. It was horrible. For three months I was studying and I couldn't see any light in these in these people. There was there was a Tillich, I forget his first name, a, a German theologian by the name of Tillich. He wrote 500 books about Christianity. He didn't know who Christ was. On his deathbed, he was reading uh, the book of the book of Tibet about the dead. He lost his faith totally. And the reason is because they didn't know the theology of St. Gregory of Palamas. They lost the uncreated grace and the importance of us communing with divinity. You see, in the West, God is up there and we are down here. There's no connection. If the grace of God is created, then our mysteries have created grace, so they're humanistic. They're human. They're of human energy. It's like a lot of our people are infatuated with yoga nowadays. Yoga, you know, uh, to, uh, spirituality, spiritual, you know. To, to, that's all human energy. It's good, but it's human energy. It doesn't connect you with God. The uncreated energy of God is divinity. It gives us the potential to unite with God. It's like having a sun up there, and that's what the West teaches. We have the sun up there, the disk, but not of the light and the warmth comes down here. So it can't really commune with the sun. So it can be in a basement, in other words, in the basement of our passions, and we don't have we don't have the way to fight these passions, bring them to the surface. Put them out in the sun, so the sun of righteousness can destroy our passions. And this is what happens. It's not by accident that over 57% of the pastors in Protestantism have a real problem with pornography. I don't blame them. They don't have the way to bring these passions up and offer them to the Lord, to take them to holy confession and begin to fight with them with all the discipline that we spoke in the last three lectures. And I pity the priests in Catholicism. They have lost the way, the way of purification, illumination, and theosis. So when you're relying on human tactics and human energy, Without the help of God, Christ says, without me, you, can, you cannot do anything. Of course, you can build buildings. You can do horizontal things. But the spiritual things, to fight, to, to fight Satan, you need the grace of God. And the grace of God is divinity. It's uncreated. 
And we have the way to unite with that grace. That's what our mysteries are. Our mysteries are divinity. It's not the substance of God. It's not the essence of God. But the energy of God is actually the substantial energy that comes out of the essence of God. Essence is a better word than substance. So St. Gregory knew all this, and although he had all the theology, I mean all the theological knowledge in his brain, he already had that. He had all the intellectual knowledge in his mind. He knew that there was something more. His heart needed to be purified. So at the age of 20 years old, he says goodbye to his family. He took his two sisters with him and his two brothers, and they walked, they went towards Thessaloniki. They walked. He walked and he went to find a teacher at the monastery of Batopedi. And he stayed there for two years. He found a, an ascetic with the experience of the unceasing prayer who was at the state of illumination and he taught him everything how to begin to purify his nose purify his heart and come to illumination and theosis and for two years he was crying out Lord illumine my darkness what darkness? he had no sins compared to us today he was an angel but see, later on he became an archbishop. But his mind was dark compared to the light of Christ, compared to the purity that Christ can give us. Because what happens, what is his hesychasm? Hesychasm is not like nirvana, it's not like Buddhism, it has nothing to do. Our hesychasm is the stillness that we need to tame down our passions, to get away from the causes of sin, to quiet our mind, and then, once we get away from the causes of sin, then all of a sudden we will be bombarded with logismus, with thoughts. Now we have to fight thoughts, and that's what monks do. Monks in Mount Athos, they don't have any causes of <coughs> sin. They don't have television, of course they didn't used to have cell phones. Now they do, unfortunately. Um, so at that point they take the time to fight with their thoughts and that is a gruesome fight to bring those passionate thoughts out of their heart to the surface and begin to fight them one by one remember the life of, of uh, St. Joseph the Hesychast for seven years although he was very pure in the world he had a fiance he didn't even kiss her not even once. Not even once. And I believe she died or something. And after that, see how God works. <laughs> he put her in paradise, and later on he'll see her, but you know she will be. <laughs> and that happened to another saint, uh, Parthenios. He was engaged, and uh, after he came from Asia Minor, she was over there. Can you imagine that? You, you, you know, the love of your life, and you come back and she's all in the grave, he couldn't handle it. So he went and dug her up after like a, a week. And after he saw the decomposition, he says, This is what I gave all my heart for, all my love. And he went straight to become a monk. Uh, that's a calling, it's not for all of us. Do get any ideas? <laughs> So the same thing with Joseph the Hesychast. For seven years, although he was a great purity, but the demon of fornication was fighting him for seven years. For seven years, he would not leave him alone. Seven years. He spent sleeping on a chair for an hour or two because that spirit would attack him mercilessly. So St. Gregory at the age of 20 put his sisters in a <coughs> convent and his brothers somewhere else and he went to fight his passions, to fight with the evil one. 
and for two years he was crying out, Lord, illumine my darkness. He would eat on the weekend and be with the monks and the other brothers. They would have their meetings, the Western questions. And then from Monday to Friday, he was in a cave all by himself, probably without eating, fasting, and crying out to the Panagia and, and, and Christ to illumine his darkness. You know, at some point after that two-year period, the Virgin Mary appeared to him with St. John the Theologian. He says, why are you crying? What is your problem? The Panagia told me. <laughs> Well, I, I want, I want to, I want to see the light of your son, you know, and uh, they spoke. And he says, Gregory, I will be with you. Don't worry, I will be with you. And then he asked her, Are you going to be, are you going to be with me in this life or just in the other life? <laughs> you see. He says, I, I will be with you in this life as well. And then after that, he went to uh, Beria. And he stayed in a cave, as I said, for about five years. And then at some point, that's where he had that uh, discussion with, uh, with the monk Job, who was saying that lay people should not be doing a Jesus prayer. But after Gregory tried to convince him, he would not be convinced. And he went back to his cell. He just, okay, that's fine. Whatever you want to believe. And that night, an angel appeared to Mount Job and told him, Mount Job, why did you argue with Gregory? Gregory is correct. So that the next day he got up and he ran out of his cell and he went and did pr prostrated himself in front of Gregory, who was 30 years younger. He humbled himself, said, forgive me, and I was wrong. And after that, the case was closed. But from now we see that even lay people can practice the Jesus prayer. However, we should not give that prayer to people outside of the church. It is not an exercise like yoga. It's not meditation. You know, we can begin to practice that prayer, you know, with along with the mysteries of the church, and along with studying of the scriptures very humbly, and uh, we should not, the focus should not be for us to see some vision or to see something, you know, in our dreams because the devil is a great, uh, you know, he, he can make things up or he can appear in dreams and uh, delusion is around the corner if that's our focus. So we very humbly ask God to live in our darkness and to be with us and have mercy on our sins. So St. Gregory, once again, after he left Mount Athos, he was invited to go to the Salmoniki. He became the Archbishop of the Salmoniki. And at the time, there was dissension in Constantinople, and he was trying to go and mediate between the, the political differences in Constantinople. On a lot of those trips, he was apprehended by the Muslims, and they took him for two, three years. And they were asking, they were asking him, what do you think of our Prophet Muhammad? Do you like our Prophet Muhammad? I said, no, I don't. And they were going to kill him. But they wanted, they, they wanted him for ransom. The Turks would probably kill him. He didn't say that, yeah, yeah, the, you know, Muhammad was a prophet of God, like some of our bishops have said over the past few decades. No, he said, and after all, he says, you know, why should we like a prophet? He's not anywhere in the uh, Old Testament. Show me a prophet in the Old Testament that talks about your prophet. He spoke with boldness. I mean, he didn't obviously try to get him angry, but he said, well, look, if our faiths were not different, then, you know, we would be the same. Obviously, we have different faiths, so it's okay to have a few differences. And as he was traveling around, a lot of the Greeks who lived at uh, those areas, they would gather up and listen to his talks, you know, but, but he would uh, have dialogues with a Muslim. And that didn't stop there. 
He went to jail for three and a half years because when Barman came, he was eloquent. Barman came as a Greek theologian from southern, from Calabria. So he pretended to be orthodox, and he was writing orthodox theology, but he was intellectual theology. He did not have experience of purification, illumination, theosis. Just like somebody who reads an article on Buddhism today, or an article of Hinduism, they say, why, we have a lot of common things. Look at that. They tried to get rid of their passions. We have so many things in common. There's only one huge difference. That's all human energy. And the light that they see is the human light of the soul. It has nothing to do with the grace of God. So yoga and Hinduism, man, these people, they don't have knowledge of God, and God is going to judge them differently. But for us Orthodox, we have the light of baptism. It is unacceptable to be practicing these things to find peace and serenity, which means that we have no idea about the faith that our apostles and prophets and theologians have taught us over the years. Can you compare the peace of the human spirit with the peace of Christ? Then what is a human factor? It's a virtue. But the peace of Christ is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. It comes from God's grace. It's divine. The fruits of the Holy Spirit are divine. They're the characteristics, the characteristics of God that we can assume if we unite with God. And this was the fight and the struggle of St. Gregory, who was fighting the entire mentality of the West, and Thomas Aquinas. That, as I told you earlier, we become really good Christians the more books we read the more understanding we have. I read so I can understand. I believe so I can understand. Understand what, God? You cannot understand God. Not about mine. Wasn't St. Augustine trying to understand the mystery of the Holy Trinity on some beach? What did you see? You saw a little child trying to empty the ocean in a, in a little cup like that. And Augustine asks him, what are you doing, uh, my son? What are you doing? Well, I'm trying to empty the ocean in this cup. <laughs> he laughed at him. <laughs> That's impossible. And it was an angel. That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to understand the Holy Trinity in his little mind. Intellectually, it doesn't work. So in orthodoxy, the organ by which we connect and commune with God is not the brain, but the pure heart, the noose, the purified noose, where we get the word noetic, noetic prayer. It's the noose, the eye of the soul. It's part of the soul, the heart, another term. Uh, noose and heart are interchangeable. Some fathers use uh, heart as the essence of the soul, and uh, Nous, the mind of the soul. It's a lot more clear in the Greek scriptures in the New Testament. So the struggle in orthodoxy, the struggle of asceticism, is not to do a lot, a lot of frustrations, a lot of fasting. That is not, that is not the end. That's not the goal. It's a means to an end. The purpose is to purify our heart so God can reveal himself on our purified heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. They will see what? Yes, they'll see the vision of God. They will see the light of God. Many of our saints see the uncreated light, the same light 
that the three apostles, the pillars of the apostles, saw on Mount Tabor. That light always existed. That was always there. Christ was divine from his conception. But he opened their eyes as much as they could. As much as they could. Because our eyes cannot see that light in its intensity. <clears throat> the state of theosis is not even in the theory of the Western Christian. Purification, illumination is not even in their vocabulary because of their flawed theology. The flawed theology of the Pope, who has Christ up there, and he's the representative of Christ on the earth. Christ in heaven, the Pope is in the earth. It's all about authority. And in my book, uh, Exodus from Roman Catholicism, my Exodus from Roman, which uh, is on some website, and uh, it's out of print now. But one of the cardinals during the 15th century said, you know what, the Pope is even higher than Christ. <laughs> what? Because, because the Pope has the ability to sin, but Christ didn't. So Christ didn't have the experience of sin. So that makes the Pope higher. <laughs> Such philosophy on the knot is really deep, isn't it? <laughs> That's deep. Yeah, yeah, it took me, yeah, you see, the Pope can sin, and they did sin plenty. <laughs> if, you, if you study history a little bit. And, uh, but Christ, because he didn't have the experience of sin, then, you know, he doesn't have the same experiences as the Pope. And, you know, some of the abbesses are even higher than the Virgin Mary. It was an abbess who was so possessed by demons and so much arrogance, because we think that everybody who becomes a monk becomes a saint. If we don't have humility, we can become demons. It was an abbess that so much arrogance that she was saying to the Virgin Mary, you see, Virgin Mary, I'm better than you because I'm a virgin, and I never gave birth to anyone, but you gave birth. I mean, is it not the demon speaking for this poor person? That's what delusion can do. So St. Gregory saw the danger here that we're ready to reduce the Christian faith to an intellectual exercise, to something that doesn't save. We will lose the grace of God if we believe that the grace of God is created. If the grace of God is created, then what saves us? Why do we take Holy Communion? So we can have created grace on human? They believe that the grace of the mysteries was something that's created here in the world by God. But it's not divinity. Who is they? Excuse me? You said they believe? They believe. Uh, well, obviously, the Protestants and, and, and the Catholics, because the, the, the Protestants were children of houses. The theology is the same. Also that of too? course, they, they believe in created grace. The Roman Catholics have broke, they have lost the, and the uh, theology of the uncreated grace. They don't believe that God has energies. They believe that love is the essence of God. But if love is the essence of God, then and justice is the essence of God, then God cannot help it. He has to punish those who are unjust and those who sin, because that's in his essence. So that's why, you know, he cannot just sweep Sins under a rug, according to Calvinist theology. Sin needs, needs to be punished. But 
lay down a theology, the justice of God, the righteousness of God, the love of God, these are all energies of God. They're energies of God. He creates with his energy. God creates with his creation of energy. And everything communes with the energies of God. And that's why the church fathers saw the whole planet, the whole world, as created by God and connected to God. Because nothing can exist without the energy of God. Everything communes with the energies of God. So we have different, it's the same energy, but we have the existential energy for the stones and the, uh, you know, and the rocks and the clay. How do they come to exist? From the energy of God called the creational energy of God. And then we have plants, animals, they share in the vivifying energy of God that makes them alive. And then we have people who can't commune in the sanctifying energy of God. Because we are created in God's image, we have the potential to commune in God's sanctifying energy, and we, we can become holy brothers. Evgenius Vulgaris, the first Patriarch of Constantinople after the fall, he told Thomas Aquinas and the West that we have three proofs that you don't have that the Holy Spirit is in the Orthodox Church. And these three proofs are this. And Father just did, he just sanctified the water a few minutes ago. He did an Ayazmo, sanctification of the water in his home, to bless this home. Now, if we take that water and put it in the foundation of this home, 500 years from now, when this home is rebuilt, that holy water will be as fresh as today. The Catholics, they have to put salt in it. The same thing with Holy Communion. For Holy Thursday night, when, it, when we take the Holy Communion, the, and we, uh, we use that Holy Communion for the sick people, and we put it in the Octophorium, there's no corruption of that Holy Body and Blood of Christ for a whole year. There's no corruption. No corruption of the Holy Water. And no corruption of our sins. Saint Spiritum's body is still incorrupt after 1,500 years. And a proof that the church still is the church of Christ is that it produces holy relics. You read it, you heard it said that a church that does not produce holy relics is lost its purpose. So the primary work of the church is to sanctify the people and then we will take care of the poor then we will do the work of Martha Martha, Martha yes you can feed the people but first we have to tell the truth, know the truth so you don't go astray and Mary has chosen the good part so become like Mary, Martha, when the Word of God is here, when God is here in front of you. And this is what the West lost. That's what Barlam was teaching. Monasticism is useless. Here, this man came, he was eloquent, he was dressed in a very nice way. He probably wore a nice suit like, uh, well, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> But some, like some of our bishops today, they like suits and they like, okay, that's fine, you know, no problem. But that's how Barlam was. He was very eloquent, you know, well groomed, and that impressed the high society of Thessaloniki. Wow, that's fashionable. That's how we want our priests. Yes, they look good. They're going to attract people. What kind of people are going to attract? <coughs> The secular ones. 
the secular ones. People who are tired of becoming holy and practicing the faith. Those who, those who suffer from archivia, spiritual laziness, spiritual sloth. And because they have a majority, the ecumenists love to cater to that crowd because they pay the bills. We understand that. Because the remnant is only 5 to 10% of the church. The remnant by itself cannot pay these huge bills that we have nowadays. To have all these dialogues and spend thousands of dollars, millions of dollars in these dialogues that produce nothing. Well, actually, they don't, not only they don't produce anything, but every time we go to a dialogue, we lose ground, lose ground, lose ground. And Satan Gregory says, listen, this Bar Young guy is not teaching orthodoxy. He's preaching the social gospel. He's preaching rationalism. Because people didn't understand, just like a lot of our priests and bishops today, they don't understand the purpose of monasticism. Monasticism is the oxygen of the church. Without monasticism, we lose our criterion. I don't want to tell you what was happening at our seminary 30 years ago, before these monasteries came, came around. I was there. I don't have time to tell you. But I thought I was, I thought Jim and Tammy were going to walk down the aisle any time. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I mean, this, this was our, our Sunday school teachers at a Sunday school conference 30 years ago at our seminary. And I said, I'm getting out of here and I'm not, come, I'm not coming back. But 20 years later, I needed some books, so I went there and I found a huge difference. That is the difference that monasticism is. A lot of young seminarians having spiritual fathers going to confession. Confession was unheard of in the Orthodox Church. Very few priests practice confession. Oh, a little confession? You know, I was in, I was in, I was Gene Sato was in Baltimore. We did, we did a seminar. I was there for 20 years. And Archbishop Demetrius is right, is sitting right there. And a prominent member of the church as the Archbishop. But Archbishop, I thought confession was something that the Catholic Church did. Uh -huh. He's not the only one. Monasticism is the oxygen of the church, the criterion. And the demons hate monastics. As I said earlier, we have one or two demons fighting us, about 40 demons fighting each monastic and hundreds of them fighting priests. So pray for your priests, send the monastics. So yes, we thought that we can really attract a lot of people if we have nice halls and play, offer basketball to our children and give them a lot of dances for them and take them to campgrounds and give, show them a lot of fun. You know. Activities, activities. And now these kids should come back after college. Where well, now a lot of our a lot of our youth that have a prayer group and pray and they know the theology, you know, they come back from college, they continue to chant. We have wonderful young people in our church that are chanting, they're learning Byzantine, they're learning the faith, and they stay with the faith. Because young people, they like struggle. We like structure. Do you know why Mohammedanism I mean, and the Muslims are doing so well in France and England? Because these people lost it all. They have no structure, nothing. At least they'll give them some structure that they took from us. They give them some fasting. You know, Muhammad took our Old Testament and he put a few things together and created the Quran. So they have some discipline. <clears throat> because in our heart we know that we're not doing well we know our passions and that gives them some kind of discipline which is better than nothing 
And that's why in the West we have the death of God. We have books and the theology of the death of God. God is dead. Of course he's dead. They put him to death. If you put him up there and you have no communion with him at all, then there's really no way to commune with God because God is uncreated and the reality here is created. And the only way that we can get, we can bridge that gap is by the purification of our heart. Because God wants to make an abode, his abode in our purified heart. So through the orthodoxy and the asceticism of St. Gregory Palamas, as we said earlier, we have walls, brick walls in our heart. That's what our passions are. So every time we go to confession, every time we fast, every time we read our book, we begin to knock down some of these bricks. And we begin to, we begin to bring a little bit of light in our heart. And then more light. And then more light. And then more light. And we begin to progress that way. And we fall and get up again. But we are struggling. We're beginning our journey. And some of you may read uh, St. Saint, Saint Simeon, the New Theologian, who said something very that depresses us at the time. So, of course, he's speaking, he's a saying, he said that unless you see God from this life, you will not see him in the other life either. If we take that literally, we will become very depressed. And how do we see God? We see the grace of God. I mean, we see the and that begins, that journey begins at the very moment that we decide I need to change my life. I had enough of this world. I had enough. I'm going to go to the priest. I'm going to confess. That begins our journey to the mountain of Pharisees. And even if we are at the very beginning, because we are beginning and we are looking that way, that direction, if we die on that direction, on the path, the perfection will continue after we die. And God will perfect us after we die. But the soul that's walking toward God, not the soul that's running the other way. So St. Gregory is a model of prayer. And the protector of theologians, you hear that in the church today? I read this. I went to St. John's and uh, I had such a wonderful experience at St. John's because I, you know, I saw the, the best bloody data, the best icon of the Panagia I've seen for a long time. I mean, just that, that Virgin Mary, she stands right there and she's the connection. She's the neck. I mean, she's the connection between earth and heaven. That's why we read in the salutations. She was the one. She's the bridge who brought God to us. Now, why do we pray to the Virgin Mary? Why do we go to the Virgin Mary? Because Christ came to us through her. Christ came to us through her. So we go to him through her. She's our mother. She knows our struggles. She was at the state of affairs at the age of three. She left her mother, went straight to the temple. And according to St. Gregory Palamas, she was the first hazy cast at the age of three. Don't try to understand that now, okay? <laughs> Don't try to analyze it. You know, that would be rationalism. The age of three, she left her mom and walked towards the Holy of Holies. And there, in the Holy of Holies, she developed another path to God through noetic prayer. According to St. Gregory Palamas, who calls her the first Hesychus and the fortress of the virgins and all those who run to her. You see? And she's the one who will give us the gifts of the Holy Spirit. It was the Virgin Mary that gave Joseph the Hezekiah unceasing prayer. Remember that in the book? 
when that rape came from the little chapel on top of Mount Athos, and that rape came, entered his heart, and all of a sudden, the prayer began to work all by itself. There's never a saint that didn't love the Virgin Mary. So he's a model of prayer. And we have different levels of prayer. Of course, we have prayer at church. We have the prayer at home. We'll pray a little bit in the morning and some at night. And if we have a little extra time, it's best to have a program. We need a program, even if it's for five minutes. Five minutes to sit down in a quiet room before everybody wakes up and you know we have to rush kids to school and before we run to, if we could take five to 10 minutes and repeat that monologisti, the one thought prayer. Monologisti et pi, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. And we repeat that for five minutes. And the Father say that the prayer will teach you you don't have to analyze things. Just repeat it and try to concentrate on the words. Don't look for any visions. Don't look for, don't try to imagine things. Concentrate on those words. And initially, you're going to hold on to that prayer for a minute or two before your mind scatters all over the place. And that's going to happen because our mind, our noose is falling and loves to run all over the place. And this happens to monks, to bishops, or anything. The bishops were celebrating liturgy, they are constantly concentrating. Of course, they're bombarded with thoughts. That's natural. It's not supposed to be, but now it's second nature for us. That's the consequence of the fall. So we do that for five minutes, ten minutes, and we increase that a minute every month. And at the end of the year, we can be praying for like 15 minutes. And then on the way to work, instead of listening to the news that are going to upset you and lose your peace, turn that radio off and say the Jesus prayer. Or listen to the Psalms. Put on your phone, listen to the Psalms. In English or Greek, whatever language you like. The Jesus prayer. And also when at work, just for a few minutes during lunch, take a minute or two. That's called constant memory of God. Constant memory of God. And then we'll have the peace that we need when a co-worker comes and attacks us and accuses us. You know, we will be able to control our temper because we'll then prepare. We'll close our mouth. We can be fuming inside. And that's the beginning of fighting anger. Psychologists said, oh, no, don't hold it. No, no, <coughs> hold it inside. Don't blow up. Hold it inside because you're going to regret some of the things that you said. Hold it inside and just pray. And that prayer is going to really <coughs> help our whole day. And then at nighttime, we pray 5, 10, 15 minutes, whatever ability we have. For two years, St. Gregory was begging for the mercy of God to illumine his darkness. And he struggled immensely. Not only he was put in jail, he was exiled because people sided with Barlam. Just like today, people side with the communists. Do you hear the names of St. Justin Popovich very much? No. Dimitri Stanaloi, the greatest theologian in Romania, do you hear his name too much? No. The name of George Florovsky, a little bit. The name of Father John Romanidis, very little. The name of Athanasius Mytilineos, never in Greece. He's more popular in America and Lebanon than in Greece, at least from the bishops and archbishops. Maybe three, four, Archman tries to give him a little bit of credit for the thousands of talks that he has done because he's an anti communist and a polybus. 
further called invaders. They were the faction of ascetics in Mount Athos who fought the Western spirit during 1800s by saying saying equality was the hack right and a dozen of others who were persecuted and pushed away out of the holy mountain because they said our tradition is to have memorial services on Saturdays and not on Sundays because Sunday is the date of the resurrection and we do our memorials on Saturday and that's why we don't kneel on Sundays there's a canon in the first ecumenical council canon 19 that says we don't kneel on Sundays because by kneeling we reject the faith in our resurrection that our bodies will resurrect out of the graves. That's why we stand in liturgy on Sundays. And this is the teaching that got rid of George Florovsky from the seminary of Holy Cross. Of course, the Archbishop didn't agree with this. He was more pietistic to follow our emotions. So why did they decide to start the Excuse me? Because of pietism and Western influence, because of oh, the Holy Spirit is coming down on Sunday to sanctify the gifts. So why should kneel when the Holy Spirit is coming down? But the same Holy Spirit illumined the fathers in the first ecumenical council to, te to teach you in Canon 19 that on Sundays we don't kneel, but on Saturdays we do. All through the week we kneel. A divine liturgy. But on Sundays, it's the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord will, will come back. The second coming will take place on Sunday. And the graves will bust open on Sunday and our bodies will jump out of the graves. This is why we teach and believe when we are kneel. Now, don't go back and make this a big deal. Because, you know, this can be very divisive in the church. After 30 years, about 90% of our congregation in Bethlehem stands. Russians don't kneel on Sundays. Very good. Russians don't kneel on Sundays. And no, neither do the monks at the monasteries, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you didn't kneel today. What's that? I, I didn't. I was the only one standing, which, you know, I felt that. I wasn't going to kneel. I said, no, I'm not going to kneel. <laughs> That's fine. I mean, you don't, you can stand, but don't make, don't make it a subject, okay? And people ask me, now, why are you standing? And then you teach them. Okay. <laughs> don't come and try people. You don't change things abruptly. It cost George Florovsky for his position on the Holocaust. And after that, Father Romanides left as well and went to Greece. He's also Gregory the Miracle Worker. He was doing miracles during his lifetime. His father was a miracle worker, and so was Gregory. Some monks tried to poison him, and he knew it, and you know, he escaped their food, and he said. Also, he was exiled at the island of Limnos, and there was a plague. It shows, in Thessaloniki, it shows the eloquence of Barlam over Gregory. They just exiled him, like St. John of Chrysostom and many others. So they exiled him at this island, and in, this, in the fortress that they kept some people, uh, the plague took over. There was some kind of a plague, and he prayed and he healed the people who had the plague. And his disciples, his students said, no, no, let's not go. Come on, we're going to get infected. He says, come with me. He said, no, 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 you know, I don't want to be infected. And finally, he went, he healed everybody, and then his disciples got infected as well because they didn't want to do obedience. They got infected. Mm -hmm. And then he prayed and made them well. 
And after the Salonicans find, found this out, they said, please come back, come back. <laughs> so now they received him back as their archbishop again. And uh, after an illness, a short illness, you know, he was ready to just give up his spirit. And he saw the light, this light as a woman. And he said, Istai Purana, Istai Purana. He said, enough of the earthly, it is time to join the heavenly. Mm -hmm. And he gave up his spirit. The great theologian of our church, the champion of orthodoxy, saying, Gregory Palomas, may we have his intercessions and the strength and boldness to defend our faith in these difficult days that we live on. Amen. 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 Any questions or comments or... Yes, Annette. Uh, oh. so, Sophie. Susan. I have Catholic friends who are very, they're still a little hurt, uh, quite a bit hurt that I went to Orthodoxy rather than theirs. And they are always trying to kind of bridge the two. Mm. And um, you mentioned St. Augustine. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times they will mention St. Augustine in their arguments. And I know we revere St. Augustine, but he didn't say everything that was exactly kosher, I understand, with orthodoxy. And was it St. Photius that questioned what, I'm, you know, I'm a new convert. Sure, sure, I've got no. great pockets of ignorance. That's fine. But, um, but I think we... I think when I, I looked it up just online mm -hmm. uh, at the Orthodox sites, uh, I think, I mean, we recognize him as a saint, St. Augustine. Yes. But not, you know, uh, not everything he says was, or maybe some people feel he was misunderstood and didn't say it the right way. Well, he made mistakes. Yeah. And he made so mistakes, yeah. it was, was uh, St. Gregory after. After Augustine? Uh, uh, okay. Augustine was uh, first century. Saint, he, Saint Augustine, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Saint, Saint Augustine, he was brilliant. He was, uh, the church, the church acknowledges Augustus' repentance. His repentance was great. I mean, his re coming from Manichaeism and all these ideologies, and, you know, they, the church focuses on the, on the depth of his repentance. Oh, okay. I mean, his theology was flawed only because at the time he didn't know Greek. And most of the theology was written in Greek language. So he was not able to, if he had known Greek and studied the Cappadocian Fathers, he would have studied Chrysostom and, uh, you know, Jerome, he wouldn't have any problem. But he was fighting and war in it. So I kind of, Sympathize with Augustine, because he did write at the very end. But if I didn't find any, any mistakes, I mean, he tried to rewrite some of those things, right. but he, he was running out of time. You know, he just said, if I made a mistake, please forgive me. You know, so he did make some mistakes. His theology was off in some areas. And unfortunately, because they didn't have, and it's really, if we had really strong theologians in the West, they would have corrected the theology of Augustine, but they lacked the yeast to correct this theology. But we also had some teachers in the, uh, in the East, like Origen, who was a phenomenal teacher, and taught a lot of untruths, but the church corrected all that. They said, no, this is wrong, this is wrong, but Basil and the Cappadocians, they benefited they benefited greatly with the work of uh, Origen. But they were able to, like St. Gregory the Theologian, were able to discern and say, this is wrong, this is bad, this is not good. And Origen was before the ecumenical councils. Okay. So. By Origen, you, you mean like original sin, death? Yes, they, okay. they call it the ancestral sin. Ancestors, the ancestral right. sin. Of course, Augustine, Augustine made some uh, misinterpretations there, and, uh, and also when he started, he started the theology of the Trinity. He started with the one essence, the, and at the time it was called substance. So where 
in Orthodox theology in the East, we started with the three persons. We have another major difference, but I don't, I don't want to expand on that. Okay, any other questions? So, by the way, none of our saints are perfect. I believe the only the, the only the only um, theologian that, from what I understand, and you know, I, I hope I'm correct, that did not make any noticeable mistakes was Saint Gregory the Theologian. All the others had a mistake or two. But if somebody would show it to them, they would acknowledge it and back off and say, yes, I was wrong. So if I make a mistake, if I make a mistake tonight, okay, which I do, you know, somebody will point it out to me and say, yes, you're right, I, I made a mistake. But if I say, no, I don't agree with you, just like Nestorius. Nestorius was asked to repent a number of times. The other bishops wrote letter after letter to him to come to his senses, but he refused. And then the church had to excommunicate him. That's why we have three theologians in the church. We have St. Gregory, the theologian, St. John, the theologian, the, uh, the uh, disciple that Christ loved the most, and then we have St. Simeon, the theologian, three theologians. But I believe the greatest theologian of all is the Virgin Mary. <laughs> because she had those lovers in her womb for nine months. She didn't just write theology with her mind and news, okay? She had the he had God in her womb and she was communing. She was taking holy communion with the blood of Christ in her womb. Just to give you the power of the person of the Panagia. For nine months, her blood was communing with the blood of God in her womb. Yeah. <laughs> you never heard of that. <laughs> oh, and St. Augustine, did he, did he start the, uh, the, the, the Catholic notion of uh, the Immaculate Conception of Mary? No, no, no. That was 19th century. Yeah, I, was. Well, I, they voted on it or something. Yeah, I, 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 I thought they were telling me that St. Augustine did something that, okay. If, 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 I have a lot to learn. If, if she was conceived immaculately, then she has nothing to do with us. She has nothing to do with us. She has nothing to do with her nature. Right. So we are, what, what cannot be assumed cannot be healed. Mm -hmm. So we have no healing. Right. That's a huge heresy. Right. One of the greatest heresies, along with the Young of Grace, along with Filiopre, along with the primacy of the Pope, along with the, uh, uh, with the, what's the other one? The infallibility. Mm. <laughs> Info what? <laughs> infallibility. Just do a little bit of study of the Popes. I mean, they should be ashamed of themselves. I mean, it's historically, one of the Popes, the, the outlook, the scriptures in Italy, the outlook of the scriptures, so from now on, I'm going to rewrite the scriptures, and you have to read my scriptures. Wow. He rewrote the scriptures, and it was so flawed that it took them like 40, 50 years to get rid of those scriptures and get back to the to, to sanity. Who was it? I can't recall. Oh, okay. But I, I translated that book. <laughs> Well, on all those points, I'm, I'm trying well. to have a conversation with my friends. I have a lot. I'm trying well, to study and trying to get ahead of... Don't, don't fight them. Just yeah. uh, try to love them and tell them that you're very happy where you're at. Well, you they're are. wonderful friends. They're wonderful yeah. friends. And yes, you can be friends. Like today, I, I also see that was speak, uh, speaking in the church. Yes, I mean, they're doing wonderful work. Uh, it's like the International Orthodox uh, Ministries or something. Christian charities. Christian charities. I mean, they can work with the Catholics, they work with the Muslims, you know. Let's do that. Helping each other, that's fine. But let's not talk about having dialogue so we can unite. There's nothing there to unite. There's nothing to unite. You, you, you cannot unite water and oil. It doesn't happen. With two different faiths. Any other questions before I go? Well, this is the very first time I hear that you should not kneel. 
was unknown, even in Thessaloniki 50 years ago, <laughs> and the other seminaries, very few exceptions. So thank God we rediscovered you know, our Orthodox theology because there was a remnant in the church, the Polyvadis Fathers and their work of St. Gregory, I mean, St. Nicodemus Hagerite, and uh, a lot of the, uh, the other bishops, we always have the remnant in the church that eventually began to publish books. And thank God we, have, we never have seen such a blossoming over 2,000 new monks in Mount Athos, you know, after 1970. When they went there, a lot of these new monks, the average age in these monasteries was 75 to 80. They were crying. The monks was like, we will not have anyone to bury us. The monastery of Sumanopatra had four or five elderly people that said, we haven't seen a tantra for 30 years. And then all of a sudden, when everybody expected the end of Mount Athos, boom, just blossomed all over. Thank God for that. So again, we don't make it, it's just like, uh, we don't make it a big deal if somebody wants to wear a mask or not in church, that's really their private uh, situation. Because if somebody wants to kneel and not kneel, it's a private thing. We don't vocalize it. Okay. Annette? Yes, I have a question. In regard to prayer, what are the different levels of prayer that you can Tell us briefly. Well, I can't really tell you because I, <laughs> I don't why? have that kind of experience. Uh, you know, you, I think, so you have to speak by experience. That's why we, we go to monasteries to learn from our monks because they are the ones who exercise prayer uh, at least 10, 12 hours a day. For us out here in the world, if I you know, will say from what I have study from those monks and from what I have uh, experienced from them. So everything is prayer. Even this gathering is prayer. You know, every time we remember God, that's prayer. You know, when I, when I go outside with my child so I don't disturb the people in the church, that's prayer. You know, we're, that's connection. It, it is, we're connected with God. Whenever I'm helping my fellow person, when I'm, I'm giving up my time to go help someone in the name of Jesus Christ, it's part of prayer. All those actions connect us with God. And it's the highest thing that we can do all day. It's really the most important thing of our day. Because, you know, when we do, our, when we do other actions, they are virtues, they are good things. But when we pray, we actually connect with God himself. That is our time to pour our heart out to God. So prayer is, can take place, we have public prayer, just like we did 
Friday night. Liturgy is not prayer. We don't go to liturgy to pray. We go to liturgy to worship. That's latria. We go and everything we do in our life is to prepare us for those special moments with God. All these other virtues, fasting, helping the people, uh, visiting the sick, all these things are to prepare our mindset so when we go to God, we're not going empty-handed. So we will attract the grace of God. Actually, we open our heart to God. So on Sundays, we worship. We go to liturgy, and liturgia is like the work of the people. We go there to work. What is the work? To struggle very hard to focus our mind on what's going on at that moment. And of course, the evil one will come and take our mind away, but we'll bring it back. With a Jesus prayer, with, we have a thought that comes uh, to get rid of that thought. We can use different ways by the Jesus prayer, by substituting it with another thought, but by staring at these beautiful icons, staring at the Virgin Mary and praying to her to strengthen us to continue to take part in the liturgy, to become, to become participators of this table that's being served for us. That's a meal. That's the supper, the last supper. That's what liturgy is, the supper of the Lamb. So that's what the liturgy is the highest thing on earth, the highest thing that we have. It's the kingdom of God on earth. That's why we start with blessed is the kingdom. It's like a window that we enter, a door that we enter into the kingdom of God. But because we are very, very weak people and, and, and we really don't have the understanding, of course we're going to go there and do the best we can. But it's best to be there. Even if our mind is distracted, if, if, even if we don't get much out of it, even if it's in a different language, we will get grace just by going there. Just by going there, by making the effort to be there. Because it's not about understanding. A little child that doesn't understand receives grace. They receive grace. It's not about intellectual understanding. It's about the grace of God connecting with a pure heart. The heart that we're trying to cleanse, and the children already have a pure heart. So, other states of prayer, well, we, we try prayer initially with our lips. We start with our lips. We say the prayer loud. And then, if we're at work, then we pray just like we read a newspaper. We don't read there and read the newspaper loudly. We read it with what? That on. That's called noetic prayer. So that's noetic prayer. I can sit here and talk to you and also say the Jesus prayer because we have what we can we have the ability to multitask. You know, I can talk with my mind and also pray with my other what's called the news. And then when we do this, and this is a gift, then the prayer goes from the mind to the heart, but there's a lot of presuppositions. And we don't make any goals. We go out from there and pray without seeking goals and saying, after one year, I'm going to be at this level. After two and a half years, <laughs> it doesn't work like that. You know, it's if God gives us grace, he will give us prayer when he sees that we will not hurt ourselves. He will give us gifts of the Holy Spirit when he sees that we will not hurt ourselves with them. Imagine if we could do miracles, huh? <laughs> we will tell everybody. <laughs> we see something and we run. We have a dream and we have to tell everybody. Okay. Yeah. We close, I mean, we keep those things to our hearts. The Virgin Mary did what? She kept all those things in her heart. Very, very, and that's a refrain. Everything that she saw, she kept everything in her heart. Kept every, and that's how it's going to bring humility. She was humble. She didn't, she didn't even tell Joseph that she was with child. She didn't tell Joseph. How could she tell him? What? 
that we haven't found you worthy, so an angel came. How can you say these things? She had a golden silence. Everything was enveloped in a golden silence. And God did all this and he made all his promises. He will protect me. He put all her, all her trust in God, even though this could cost her life. Yes? On the subject of ecumenism again, mm -hmm. um, what caution and what boundaries should we as Orthodox set if our church um, is promoting, I guess, I guess I'd call them uh, Protestant enrichments, uh, you know, to the congregation, read this book, maybe go to this movie. I mean, and yes, yes. I'm sure not everything is. Of course, I understand. No, and, and we have the same problem up north. It's nothing new. It's been going on for 50, 60 years. You know, um, you know what diet is good for us. <laughs> So somebody can suggest something doesn't mean that I have to include it in my diet. I will not disrespect the priest, I will not disrespect that person, but with all due respect, I don't, we have thousands and thousands of pages of books, upon books in orthodoxy, and after I read all of those, <laughs> after 5,000 years, then I will, if I have any, any time left, then I will look at some of those. Look, you know, it's different if I am a teacher and I need to really study a book so I can combat some of, the, some of, of, of their teaching. It's a different story. But I'm not going to read those books for enrichment. Well, and of course, I'm newcomer anyway, so I don't have all the discernment. I mean, I don't never have discernment that probably but if the everything seems innocent why, then why did you need Protestantism well, to come here if you need Protestant enrichment <laughs> well it has some you know good publicity and good things and movies and uh, yeah, I mean you know we have a really good one yeah. it's called the Man of God <laughs> yeah, tomorrow some of you will see it tonight yeah tomorrow tomorrow, tomorrow night or tomorrow night <laughs> Again, I know that some of these things may sound, you know, and I, and I, and I don't want to be rebellious, but, you know, that's why years ago I decided not to work directly with the church. And my position and income would not depend on the church. And when I say the church, I mean it's human side. The church is perfect, it belongs to Christ. But we have the hierarchical side of the church. So I cannot suffer. There's some priests who suffer because they cannot say these things. So I have to say it for them. So should one ask their spiritual father, run something by them, hey, the church is promoting this? Is this well, of course, and if your spiritual father is promoting those things, you're going no, to, no, no. you need to find a new spiritual father. <laughs> no, to ask them. To ask of, course them. You are, of course I would ask them. Okay. They're not part of the church. They're, I mean, they're, they're not. They're, they're not part of your uh, of your parish. Congregation. Yeah. And that's fine. You know, so that's a, a spiritual father is like a doctor. We find a doctor a hundred miles away. Okay. We go to a specialist. Okay. And if I need to confess a few sins, I go to a you know, I'll go to a, a nearby doctor. We have a confessor and we have a spiritual father. Right. And sometimes you need to go 500 miles to speak to your spiritual father. So in the meantime, if I've got a few sins to confess, I will confess to my priest. But I will not look for direction. Yes. Okay. Father, I think we can close. Father, do you to Let us pray to the Lord. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Lord, thank you for coming upon us tonight, and thank you for bringing us, Constantine, again. We glorify and we praise you. We pray that you keep each and every one of us safe as we go home, and we pray that you guide us in our way in 
getting to know you and filling our heart with a prayer that goes beyond understanding. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Amen.